The important thing I've learned during those moments is just remain calm. Do not think that it's the end of the world. Start talking to people, start asking questions kindly and start learning about the problem mm -hmm. and working with other people to find solutions. Because as all those problems have arisen, there have been solutions each other. Mm -hmm. Welcome to The Hurdle, a podcast where we talk to interesting everyday entrepreneurs. We tell our stories. I'm Max. I'm Jade. Let's dive in. Let's go. Hello and welcome to The Hurdle. I'm Jade. This is my co-host Max. We're so excited to have Thomas here with us today. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So for the past two decades, you have opened and ran several businesses. One of them is a bar and a restaurant. You've had a coffee roastery and a cafe. And then you currently have a venture that I think is such a dad move. We'll get <laughs> yes. more into that later. Good way to describe it. But I'm obsessed with this one little franchise business you have going on Sweet. right now. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I really admire about Thomas, and I'm excited for you guys to learn about him today, is... Um, your desire to make business decisions that really align with your values and your needs. So when we met last time and talked about your history, you shared how um, you kind of have your business and professional life evolve as you evolve as a person. And I think that not all entrepreneurs um, are able to do that. And I just think that speaks a lot to your ability to like stay connected to yourself and, um, adjust as you need to so that your work supports you in your personal life. So I think it's very wow. cool. Wow. Shucks. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. you, make, you make me sound a lot better than, than I believe I actually am. <laughs> I'll take it. Well, shoot. Thank yeah. you. It inspired me. So I wanted to mention it. You your kick first, us off. Yeah. Your first venture was barn light. And I assumed that was just like fixtures for barns. Uh, but that's yes. not the case. common misconception we encountered. <laughs> but you started actually pretty young. Uh, can you remind me how old were you when, when you started? Working? I was in my mid twenties. Mid twenties. So that's a cute. I mean, and, and you didn't grow up in Eugene, but you came here for grad school. Mm -hmm. And then was it during grad school that you did it, or was it right after grad school? So I had decided to drop out of grad school. Okay, to pursue right. this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a big move. I mean, can you speak to that a little bit? Cause that's, yeah. you're on this path, there's structure, it's, right. you know, it's, it's kind of clear focus, but then you're like, nope, not for me. I'm right. going to go off and do my own thing. Right. No, uh, very good question, Max. And yeah, happy to provide a little historical context here. So, uh, I did, uh, move out here from Lawrence, Kansas, mm -hmm. where I went to college and, um, where I worked as a bartender and barista for right. some time after college and fell in love with the industry there. Uh, at a place called the the bourgeois pig. Uh, the that's bourgeois hilarious. Pig. <laughs> the bourgeois pig, right? Uh, on Ninth and Mass, and uh, it was just the pig for sh short. But uh, it had a great business model. Um, I had the opportunity in college to study abroad, and you know, fell in love with sort of the European cafe model. These places that are just in different neighborhoods that are open all day and all night. You can go in for coffee in the morning, or uh, you can you know have a cocktail. Uh, in the evening. And so that was where the business model of the pig and Lawrence and uh, one that we uh, co-opted and, mm -hmm. and uh, used for the barn light uh, here in Eugene. And uh, indeed, I, I moved out here uh, from Lawrence to go to grad school in architecture. Uh, it's where I, I met my wife. So it was certainly worth it uh, for that. Uh, but I realized immediately that I had no desire to be an architect. So like and, first semester. Like, oh, my <laughs> heavens. Yeah, right away. I was like, how on earth? A, did I get accepted to this program? <laughs> and B, uh, did I find myself here? I didn't know anyone at the time when I moved out here. Uh, I bought a dog. Uh, I got a dog. Uh, and that was like uh, my, my only pal for a while, Sailor. Uh, yeah, it was it was a tough, that was like one of the lowest moments. Like I left this community I loved that came out here, mm -hmm. didn't know anyone, was, was lonely, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And uh realized that I had made this huge life transition for something that I knew wasn't right. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then uh, a very important revelation occurred late night in studio working on this work. I loathed uh, a studio mate. We were the only ones in there. It was two or three in the morning. He says, Thomas, so why, why did you want to get a master's in architecture? And I said, well, to be honest, Chris, I, I really just want to design and open up my own uh, bar and coffee shop. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, he turned and looked at me and he said, you know, Thomas, you don't need a master's in architecture right, to do right, that, right? right, right. <laughs> and it seemed like a minor exchange at the time, but it truly changed the course of my life. And I thanked Chris Deal uh, uh, numerous times since then for, for saying that to me because uh, mm -hmm. it really absolutely changed the course of my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that conversation happened, what, like 20 years ago and it still sticks. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because it's like uh, it was it was something where it helped me realize I have this dream. I have this interest. Um, instead of like saying, oh, that's something I'll do later. Or once I earn enough money in a right. traditional career path, then I can do this later on in life. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the responsible thing to do. It said, well, if you're if you're thinking about that all the time, you're passionate about yeah. that, invest energy and in making that a reality, mm -hmm. essentially. And so uh, so that's what I started doing at that point. So it wasn't this like moment of like arrival where you, you got, OK, now I can do that. You, you, right. you were like, OK, I need to just do it now. Yeah. Right? I mean, and then that's just to make that move to leave kind of like you could argue a secure, stable kind of path. You went yeah. and, and, and did the barn light, um, right. which uh, so I didn't know this, but like coffee in the morning. Right. right. And then drinks at night. And then I think you mentioned you were closed for only four hours a day. Oh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So when we first opened, yeah, we again, we try to emulate the hours. My business partner and I, he and I worked together at the barn in Lawrence, Kansas. And uh, we, we tried to emulate the business model. We loved it. Mm -hmm. We believed in it. Um, mm -hmm. And and so we, we sort of replicated the, the hours of operation, which were uh, open at 6 in the morning. And we stayed open until 2 in the morning um, as, a, as a bar. And um, the, the bulk of our business and profits came from the bar side of the business. Um, and that uh, out of the gate was initially a very high volume component. Um, but we also did well with, you know, Having sort of a, a, a built-in marketplace, uh, being at the, the 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 bottom floor of this building that we're sitting in at the moment, um, mm -hmm. we had this sort of captured audience of folks working in the building who were very excited as mm -hmm. we were building out to come in and get their coffee and lunch and things like that. And so uh, it, it worked, but it was exhaustive. Yeah, because you know, also way. mentioned the first six months was just like the, some of the lowest times, oh, just because we're putting everything yeah. into it, all the effort. And yeah. yeah, that's uh, I, I, it's interesting because I feel like people have this assumption when starting a business where it's great right off the bat. They're, they're doing their dream. It's a passion project. They love putting in the hours. Right. But, you know, at the end of the day, six months and you're still putting that much time into it. I mean, did you see a light at the end of the tunnel or were you kind of assuming this is just what's, what it's going to be like? Uh, the, good questions, Max. Uh, there there are a few few things I can I can talk to you about that. Um, one is out of the gate, it was just so hyper focused on managing operations mm -hmm. uh, and and making sure the business was working and succeeding and we weren't making mistakes and mm -hmm. meeting folks and talking to folks and team building and all of these things all at once. So there wasn't really much time to think future oriented. Yeah. It was just Trend water. living in the <laughs> present and, and solving problems. And so uh, super focused on that. Uh, and, and we were honestly there um before we opened and after we opened for the first six months um, wow. almost every day and so it was there were some real low points and god bless my wife who stuck through me uh stuck with me through all of that um but yeah like you know going going through the drive through mcdonald's at 3 45 in the morning because that's the only thing open or denny's there off of i-5 right. not kidding like that's where i would eat afterwards when we had a break and I go home and and sleep for the, as much as I could, and then and then come back until we could train train some staff and get some management we we could you know count on. And uh, but yeah, it was a grind for sure for the first several months. Mm -hmm. But um, we wanted to be there and um, and oversee everything and make sure things were, were right. going down right. Um, you know, I think uh, the biggest thing was just opening the doors and seeing that it worked. Right, that people were coming in, we were doing business, yeah. we were making money, it was profitable, um, things like that. And so that was a huge yeah. uh, sense of relief. And, yeah. and it was also like energizing and, and motivating for sure to just keep that growing and humming along. You had a pretty interesting strategy when you chose the date the barn light was going to open. Right. You didn't just open it on any day, you That's opened right. it on a very specific day. And there was yeah, some thought put into it. Can you tell That's us right. a little bit about how you chose opening uh, well, day? Sure. So we opened on Thanksgiving Day, 2012. And uh, I mean, a part of that was um, informed by when we could actually 
open the doors and get our occupancy permit and things like that post yeah. build out. Uh, but we wanted to, you know, do a sort of soft opening um, uh, exercise. And, and so we we're like, okay, Thanksgiving, um, you know, we might yeah. get some folks, but it's not going to be crazy. Uh, it's a Thursday night and uh, uh, we opened the doors and it was lovely. I mean, it, it, it was, it was full in there. You know, we had a lot of folks who were tired of their family, wanted to come in and get a drink. Uh, <laughs> right. There were, you know, folks who didn't go home uh, who were here for school and um yeah it worked out great it was just what we needed and um and yeah i'll never forget it uh and yeah so that's that's awesome. when we opened thanksgiving and there was also the thing about the kickstarter right yes that's right and so um super grateful that uh the year that we were doing our build out and we were opening was us it coincided with with crowdfunding and kickstarter uh, as a means of, of crowdfunding. And, and so uh, we were raising investments for, for our business to open. And uh, I think I mentioned to you guys uh, prior, we uh, were very fortunate to partner with the city of Eugene, which at the time had this downtown revitalization loan program, which okay. uh, matched our savings um, uh, to open up the bar. And so uh, we also uh, participated in a Kickstarter uh, crowdfunding uh, program and, and, you know, had the different, uh, gifts for different milestones of investment and merch. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we even had like a, a year, of year supply of coffee or something okay. like that. And, um, and more than the actual money we raised from that, it was invaluable for, uh, for just building up hype, uh, in anticipation of us opening. And the fact that it was such a new thing and novel thing, yeah. uh, we, benefited just from the attention of, of that in and of itself. And uh, so just one of those things that was just lucky and good timing. And, right and place. so much yeah. of that honestly was, it was good timing and, and uh, a bit of good luck. It's awesome. And I know you mentioned that you had some champions in the city that worked for the city, right? I think you right. said that was <clears throat> one of the most important aspects was just building relationships with this, these planners, right? Right. So, uh, in, in much the same way that, you know, the Kickstarter really benefited us in terms of, of the sort of marketing and hype it generated uh, more than the, the monies that the city in, invested in our, in our business was the, the, the friendships and allies and partnerships mm -hmm. and relationships we developed uh, through that. And so um, they were an incredible resource whenever we encountered hiccups or hurdles. Um, we had folks who had tons of experience and mm -hmm. were cheering us on at the city to help us navigate those, those problems, whether it was, you know, something during permitting, uh, or, you know, just community issues downtown that, mm -hmm. uh, we should get involved in or have a voice in and things like that. So. Yeah. Cause you mentioned, uh, you had to have, uh, or fire retardant, um, oh yeah, yeah. There was a challenge to opening. Yeah. Actually. Oh gosh, you give me a little, uh, a little PTSD. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My heavens. Uh, yeah. So build outs can be incredibly challenging for for restaurants, and and I think it's really hard for folks to appreciate all the work and and emotion and yeah, blood, sweat, and tears that goes mm -hmm. into opening a place, even before you get the doors open. And and honestly. In just about every project we've we've done, uh, especially the ones that are like a raw shell where mm -hmm. we're going in there and doing a complete build, build out, it wasn't you know a pre food establishment prior to that. Right. Uh, there has almost always been something that comes up after we sign the lease where it's like, ah, you can't do what you want to do in here, and we're just like, oh my heavens, uh, <laughs> good grief! Like, what are we gonna do? And the important thing I've learned during those moments is just remain calm. Do not think that it's the end of the world. Start talking to people, start asking questions kindly and start learning about the problem mm. and working with other people to find solutions. Because as, as, as all those problems have arisen, there have been solutions each and every mm. time. Um, and so that's, that's the good news. And, and that was such, those were good lessons for that. Mm. Um, and so, yes, uh, the one you're alluding to Max specifically, when we were ready to open the doors, it was weeks away from Thanksgiving, 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, we were trying to get our occupancy permit, which is the thing that says, okay, you can invite the public into your states now. 
so we said, all right, we got the build out done. You know, we tested out the espresso machine. We started hiring. We're ready to open our doors. And the city was like, well, we just discovered something and it's major and it's going to involve a serious fix. And this was um, a fire retardant paint. Uh, fire. So I know more about fire intermittent <laughs> paint than I would ever want to now uh, that uh, they, they believe needed to coat all of the steel members of a seismic upgrade that this building had. Uh, when it was uh, re redeveloped or remodeled by okay. by folks out of Portland uh, Beam Beam Development, and uh, it took a long time uh, to, to find a solution for that, but fortunately, the the, the building was fine, and the the steel members of the construction were sound, and mm -hmm. uh, we we did not need to get this very expensive paint and paint everything in there. Sure. That would have taken a long time. I was, I was going to ask uh, uh, any advice for, uh, you know, new entrepreneurs to avoid those types of uh, hiccups. And I think what I'm hearing is that you should just expect something to go wrong. Well, yes. Yeah, that's a good, that's, that's a fair way to put it. Yes, no doubt about it. Uh, you know, challenges will arise, surprises will arise. And uh, again, you know, just keeping your, your head down and, and, and keeping calm and positive mm. and, and kind when dealing with others, I think is, is absolutely the most important thing to lean on in those moments. Um, mm. You know, I do think that, you know, as we've learned, as we've done this more than just one time now, uh, there, there are a lot of really good things that you can do to, to help avoid those, those major catastrophes. And, you know, one thing I recommend for, for folks uh, who are interested in, in opening up their own food establishment you know, is before you ever sign a lease, mm. you know, you're so excited about the space you discovered mm. uh, and you don't want anyone else to come in there and get it. It's the perfect location. It's the perfect space. Um, you know, restrain that excitement and do some due diligence mm. and uh, look, you know, chat with the city. They're super helpful mm. uh, in the permitting and planning department to say, hey, uh, can you use this space in the way that you want to use it? And they'll say, yes, you can or no, you can't or uh, yes, you can, but you might need to do A, B, and C in order to get there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, working with, you know, experts like architects who can say, um, this is sort of the design challenges you may encounter with this use that you need, or these are the expenses you can anticipate for uh, having a food establishment, a place that was once a daycare, mm -hmm. um, those kinds of things. So there's there's a lot of research that can happen beforehand that can save mm -hmm. you a lot of grief later on. You mentioned the first six months just being just go, 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 kind of treading water. You're there. Almost. Eating too much McDonald's. Yeah. Right, right. 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 <laughs> Many hours a Very helpful diet. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. What, what made the shift to, you know, I guess, instead of you just working for the business, but like kind of stepping back and, you know, having a life outside right. of just grinding. Right. Um, time. It takes time. Okay. It definitely takes time. And, uh, that was one of the hardest things to learn um, for, for, for my business partner and I. We were both just, we kind of fell back on just grinding and working really hard because when you work that hard, you don't have to think about much else. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you're feeling productive and you're, you're feeling like you're doing the right thing, but you definitely burn yourself out. And it was also really early in your career. Correct. Yeah. So probably your relationship to work was perhaps different than today, which- Right, very good point. Right, which yeah, we can dig good. maybe more into that later. But Absolutely. I think that's probably not atypical for young entrepreneurs. Totally, Jake. With yeah. their first venture, yeah. would you say so? Absolutely, that's yeah. a very good point, okay. Jake. And, and yeah, I, I really hope to, to touch on that in more sure. depth later. Yeah. Um, getting back to, to the prior question, and, and we were joking about the, the McDonald's and Denny's, um, that that's a, a, another, I think, important realization over, over time when you're, you're burning yourself out is a realization that this won't continue to work or succeed if I don't take care of myself, mm -hmm. right? I can't keep eating McDonald's at 3.30 in the morning forever mm -hmm. because everything around me is going to suffer. My personal relationships, my work relationships, um, myself. And so I, I remember a moment uh, of realization when my business partner and I, who were both 
very active people going into this and exercise together, so on and so forth. We got to a point where it was a reality check and really, we got to take care of ourselves, you know, and uh, drinking just tons of coffee and then having, you know, a beer, uh, you know, or two at the end of the, the night. Um, and, and we, uh, we signed up for the gym across the street. Uh, because it was convenient. We knew we could do it. We'd go in there where we could get some breaks. We'd lift some weights. We'd go in the sauna. Yeah. And that was a game changer. Absolutely game changer. Just having that outlet, just convenient and, and getting back into the routine of taking care of ourselves mm-hmm. again. Uh, and so that is something I, I really want to stress and, and say, no matter how hard you're working, please find the time and make the time to take care of yourself mm. uh, or else nothing's going to work. You can make the argument that's actually beneficial for your business. 100%. Right. You know, not, yeah, absolutely. Right. It's yeah. not like you're cheating on your business or something. No, right. Like, no, it, quite it, the opposite. Yeah. Right. 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 You're mm-hmm. investing in yourself, which if you're a better self, the company is going to be better. You can think, you know, have a more balanced outlook. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. So can you speak a little bit to the, um, the employee investment program? My oh, word's no. not yours, right. but right. You had a program where, or it that desire it, right. to invest in em- ventures sure. that were important yeah. or, or I don't know, activity. I don't know how you want to put it. That were important to your employees. Absolutely. Can you speak yeah. a little bit to that? Because I think that's pretty unique. And- sure. Awesome. Sure. Yeah. And again, something that sort of developed over time, but sure. um, we, we, we hired uh, employees that we, we truly cared about. We, we worked with over a long period of time. We're able to see the value they brought to our businesses, um, cared about them a lot. And we're excited to, to see the passion that they had for some of the things that we were doing, whether it was, um, you know, on the coffee side of things, or bar side of things. And, and, um, you know, oftentimes they would bring these interests and passions with them before they ever worked for us, but sure. um, they would evolve and grow. And over time, once we became more established and secure in what we were doing and learned the lessons that we had, we believed it was important as, as business owners to really foster those interests and desires that our employees expressed. And um, especially when they, they were interested in, in someday starting their own business Mm -hmm. and so um whenever that happened we never said oh don't do that we want you to stay here that never 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 it was like man that is so awesome like we love that you want to start your own business and we want to help you in any way we can whether that's you know helping you with your business plan or um you know chatting about challenges and hurdles to anticipate or even if it comes down to investing and and what you want to do if it's starting out as a food cart or whatever, like, let us know how we can help. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that's true to this day. I mean, if, if, if we have an employee who, who comes to us and and says they have these interests, we're going to help them do it. Uh, whether or not they, they take advantage of that is one thing, but, uh, it's out there. And I think it's important. So that's really cool. Yeah. It's that culture where even if they don't take you up on it, they know that they feel supported. Sure. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I think you mentioned you had an employee that worked there for eight years. Right. I mean, that's kind of unheard of in that industry. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Katie, uh, Katie Kruger. Uh, she, Shout yeah, Katie. yeah, we, we, <laughs> yeah uh, we still keep in touch and text and she's got a family now and lives in, in Roseburg and manages like a, a ranch that she and her wife have. Oh, that's uh, very and cool. it's, it's rad. So, uh, yeah, Katie was just a legend, uh, bartender <laughs> and, yeah, came on board in 2012 and uh, worked. Uh, she she was like all knowing, I guess, because she had worked her last day um, three weeks before the pandemic hit. Mm. That's when she it she was before. Obviously, we knew about the pandemic. She had worked her last day, and um, and then the pandemic hit. So it was it wow. was fine timing on her part. Wow. Yeah. And and that's when you decided to closed doors, right? I mean, was that, it wasn't because of the pandemic or was it another reason? Because it seemed like it was a successful business and it was 
you know, humming around. You weren't in those six for six month period right. or having oh, a life outside of your work. Yeah. But yeah, can, can you talk us through kind of the decision for closing the doors and why, why you did it then? Sure, sure. Um, so yes, that was eight years later. Um, and we had since that, you know, during that time, we had pursued other ventures and ideas and opened other shops, um, some more successful than others. Um, and we had opened, uh, you know, another barn, barn light location that then took on a few different identities as, mm. uh, as we, uh, you know, desired some vertical integration in our business. So, so we had the faucets running, so to speak, we were selling, you know, high volume of coffee and, and, and beer. And we we're like, ah, it'd be great if we could, we could make our own, uh, beer or coffee or something and, and sell it in our own place. Like, but it'd be a new challenge for us. And uh, so let's explore make, that. So yeah, sure. And tell us what what is vertical integration? Because that term might not be familiar to everybody. Right. And so can you, and, and you kind of explained a little bit just there, but can you sure. speak a little bit more? Yeah. To like, what, what is that? I'll do my best okay. to uh, to think back to my, my, my business 101 class here. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's where you have a, a, a supply chain of goods and uh, simply instead of buying one of those goods from somebody else, you're you've manufactured them yourself and okay. you're you're sourcing them from yourself. Cool. Uh, and so we, we presently do that at Farmers Union because we roast our own coffee. And so instead Which of we haven't talked about yet, we'll get to that soon. That's right. <laughs> uh, so instead of buying our coffee like we used to from um, a roaster uh, like, you know, Cova or Water Avenue, uh, you know, in Portland, uh, or tried and true in Corvallis and having them ship it all the way down here, we roast our own coffee. And so when we make you a cappuccino, it's our own coffee okay. instead of someone else. So maybe the benefits could be, you know, less, uh, you know, margin, right. You're not paying. A, a, yeah. So better margins, better, yeah, 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 better, better margins, and then maybe more control of your supply, right? Because you are the supplier, Absolutely. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, very good. That's a very good reason. To yeah, do that. I'm yeah. trying to uh, think back to my business yeah. one-on-one. And I think <laughs> there's, like, there's like a credibility that comes from it too, right? Sure. Like we are really passionate about the product that we serve because we're making it ourselves. It's our product. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So you did this with the barn light. See, so is that what you said? That's what motivated those desires or goals. Okay. Uh, was, okay. was having the faucets running, uh, selling a product and wanting to create our own product okay. to sell. So, so then you started, so what was the product? So that's when you started the coffee roastery. Yes. Eventually. Eventually. Yeah, eventually. So okay. we, we, we were fortuitous enough at, at one point to hire, uh, um, a gentleman by the name of Joe Harrison, uh, who worked for us a bit, who knew far more and can, and, and presently knows far more about coffee than, uh, I ever will, okay. uh, and was a very successful roaster in California, uh, won awards and, uh, just like a scientist, you know, like a chemist and, and really understands, uh, the chemistry of coffee roasting and has just the passion and love for the product, um, mm -hmm. that goes all the way to the source, uh, with the farmers in South America, for example. And so, um, so we were very fortuitous to meet him, uh, and to talk about, uh, ways that we could work together until we we eventually became business partners okay. and uh, worked together to buy our own coffee roaster, um, which when we had it delivered uh, wasn't um, where it presently is in the nice space of Farmers Union Coffee mm -hmm. Roasters, but was in a really tough warehouse way out west 11th um, okay. that had no temperature control and was 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 again another just it's the you know hard beginning Grind, uh, yeah. uh, of, of grinding it out um and so uh yeah that's how we okay. we got into actually making the product ourselves but just okay. to clarify that's not at the same time as you owning the barn line right? correct it right. came it came uh yeah later on yeah yeah, and, yeah. so rewind what happened with the barn light? I don't know well, if we right. got, I don't know if we, I think we went somewhere else. It would be smart to tie a bow on that. Uh, so my other business partner, Mark Shepard, uh, he and I uh, were at 
the point in our lives where we were starting families and after running a bar for eight years, we started to not feel so great about that business, right? You know, knowing that uh, our, our business exceeds the more booze we sling. And um, it just became sort of a tiresome business to be in as we were trying to, to kind of grow up and, and again, you know, start families. And um, there's, you know, a liability that you continually worry about. I'm grateful we never encountered anything like that, you know, fights breaking out or DUIs or anything like that. We were very conscientious and conservative about that. Um, but it was still something that you thought about when your head hit the pillow. And, and so um, we were already planning an exit for the bar night um, before the pandemic hit. And so uh, when the pandemic hit, as you well know, it was super brutal for the food and beverage businesses. Um, some of which are still recovering from it, uh, in many ways, but, uh, we, uh, you know, had a decision to make, and it seemed like the very obvious decision having started farmers union, uh, at that point and having the roasting business in place, uh, that that was the long-term business, uh, for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, realized we just needed to consolidate all our energy and efforts on ensuring that that succeeded. Uh, and it was just the right time to um, close the doors, the barn light, yeah. uh, or at least try to sell it, which is what we fortunately ended up uh, doing. Um, but you had an uh, interesting way of doing it that I had never heard of before. Right. And this might just be because I've never sold a business personally, but right. you hired someone to help. Right. Can you talk to us about who you hired and the advantages of sure. hiring. And please name names. We oh, <laughs> yeah. I'll refrain myself from doing that. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we had never sold a business before. Okay. Had no idea how to do it, where to start. Uh, and, and so we, uh, you know, one of my favorite things to do is just talk to people, ask questions. Folks who had done that in the past, you know, get input and advice. And we learned that um, much in the same way that there are commercial real estate brokers who will help you find a location for a business. Mm -hmm. There are uh, business brokers who will help you acquire a business or sell your business. And uh, so with everything that was going on at the time, uh, we said, okay, this will be great. We'll work with this person. They'll take a commission off the sale price, uh, but they'll ensure that we do this right and help us find a buyer. Uh, and so uh, it was successful toward that end, and, and I'm glad we did it because uh, we found some great buyers. Um, sadly, they ended up having to sell uh, shortly thereafter because of a health issue. Um, but he, yeah, he, this business broker found some great buyers, and it was a lengthy process. We learned a lot about it. Um, and then as we've subsequently sold other businesses, we've learned that we should just do it ourselves at this point. It's because you now know how to Correct. do it, yeah. right? So, I mean, because I think we asked you this earlier this week, would you do that again? He's a breaker and you're like, absolutely not. No, that's right. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, it's it's kind of, it's tough. You know, when, when you find yourself doing a lot of work um, for the deal and then, you know, these, these folks who are just long for the ride for a little bit and again, a big paycheck at the end right. that, you know, you could have kept, um, I think, dissuades you from from doing that in the future if you're able to. But it serves a purpose when you're totally. just getting started, Absolutely. and you yeah. don't have experience, and you maybe feel super overwhelmed by the process. One hundred percent. Right? Yep. Yeah. I think Absolutely. it's awesome that you were able to leverage that resource when you needed it, learn what you needed to, and exactly. then make different decisions exactly. going forward. Yeah. And honestly, I don't know how successful we would have been during the pandemic to try to sell a bar. Like, I know. That was a hard sell at the time. And so we definitely sold lower than we would have, you know, if we had sold it a year before. But again, it was yeah. it was the right thing to do at the right time. Yeah, Jade mentioned this earlier, um, but it, it, it seemed like the values you had shifted, right? I mean, right. when you're starting a family, you're, you're not feeling too good about booze being the, right. the main revenue yeah, line. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and then coffee felt better. So it just kind of, it seems like it aligned more with just who you became over the right. years, right? Yeah, yeah, very, very astute observation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I also, I also think it's interesting, there's this theme of just 
learning and digging in, you know, like that's what happened when you use the broker, right? right. You, you learned about it, the process, and then moving forward, you're like, I know, I now know how to do this, right? right. So I don't need that service. But it's just like, I pick up on the, this theme that you have where you go into the city learning about the permits and you just kind of right. building this wealth of knowledge, I think it obviously has made you very successful with what, how many other companies? <laughs> 10 or <Yeah>. 12. <laughs> <laughs> not, not quite that many, but yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm naturally a curious person and um, I enjoy building relationships. And uh, so I think, you know, with, with that as a, as a motivator, just kind of going yeah. into those conversations is enjoyable um, beyond, you know, any sort yeah. of value that comes from it. Cool. Can you talk to us about, we've, we've, we've talked a bit about the Farmers Union, but can right. you tell us about how the Farmers Union sure. came to be right. and, um, and then kind of where you're at now? Right. Great. I'll do it. Okay. Uh, so Farmers Union Coffee Roasters uh, was, was, was something that um, developed over time after I, I think I mentioned a, a few different I think failed might be a harsh word, but um, less than successful iterations prior. And so, uh, and I say less than successful because there were a number of reasons going into that. So um, rewinding a bit, um, things were going really well at the barn light. Let's open another location. So uh, with our partners at the city and the relationships we established uh, there, we learned about a really exciting new development uh, on our river here in Eugene. Uh, and all of the, the plans therein, we were very excited about. And at that time we got courted by um, a, a um, uh, financial institution who uh, had just built this beautiful headquarters right by this future development. And they wanted a cafe to go in their, um, in their ground floor. And it was a beautiful space and, and it sounds wild. And it's actually really forward thinking, I think of this financial institution, but uh, they, uh, they help support the build out for a bar and a coffee shop. So if you can imagine like going to a bank and being like, there is a bar right there. That's pretty yeah. forward thinking, I think for a financial institution. So, um, we did that and that was our second location. And we learned a lot from that because this was a destination. Uh, we, we did not benefit from the, the pedestrian traffic that, you know, the main cross streets of downtown Eugene provided for us at the barn line. And so we had to get creative and really lean on social media to drive an audience to discover us primarily from campus uh, to make that a destination mm -hmm. spot. And that took a lot of time and work. And I really credit uh, my business partners, Joe and Mark, with succeeding in doing that. Um, and so we had we had made this kind of sluggish location successful mm -hmm. um and it was full all day long uh, and at that point is when we got the coffee roaster and we had always wanted to put the coffee roaster on the floor of our cafe um for a number of reasons but uh a it just looks cool it's this experiential mm -hmm. component that your customers are able to participate in when they're standing in line waiting for their coffee they get to witness how this product is being made and that is a cool experience that you can add to a cafe mm -hmm. um, the machine itself is beautiful uh, and so as like an object of curiosity it's very captivating um, and you know it's kind of like the subway maker making your sandwich like you're like oh man these these folks really care about what they're doing and how they're doing it and they're so confident in how they're doing it they're doing it in front of you know hundreds of people walking through here right. a day and so uh so we had always wanted to do that. Um, the problem we realized uh, was in trying to do this at this location that we had worked hard to get people to find. Uh, well, there were four stories above us. And again, relying on your, 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 your relationships of, of experts, um, the architects and builders were able to quickly inform us that that would be a very costly <laughs> uh exhaust system to exhaust a coffee roaster from the ground floor all the way up through the the ceiling and i don't think the financial institution was really keen on on that either and so <laughs> yeah. we realized well, well we better look for another location uh and 
I think I mentioned this to you guys uh, when we talked prior, but uh, a year before that, uh, and I think just a really brilliant example of just, you know, take those calls, take those meetings. If you don't think anything's going to come from it, you never know. Uh, a year before that, uh, someone had reached out and said, hey, you know, we own this building. It's got a coffee shop in it now. Who knows how long it's going to last? We'd really love you to consider at some point. Uh, are you interested? And at that point, we had so much going on. We, we I had to say we weren't interested. Um, but super grateful for meeting this person and for having the opportunity. Uh, I had no idea what had transpired in that lot in that year's time since we had that conversation. But when we realized we needed a space where we could put a roaster, I said, all right, I'm going to give, give this gentleman a call and, and, and let him know we, we'd be very interested if it was still available, but totally understanding if it's not. And, uh, we learned actually far after the fact, um, but when I reached out to him the day before he had ended the lease with, with the coffee shop that was, that was in that space. Timing. Um, <laughs> and so he said, yeah, absolutely. Come and check it out. It's going to be available. And it was the perfect location. Wow. Uh, and so again, timing, luck, like. Well, and, so and being open to taking a call, right? right initially, right. that, you know, turned into an offer and that you were kind and you said, thank you for the opportunity. No, thank you. Right. But then down the road, it ended up just being absolutely. And you could yeah. have predicted that. Right. 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 Gosh, and yeah, if you don't awesome. take those initial meetings in right. the first place and build your network and those relationships, then you potentially lose out on those opportunities right. later when you find that you need them. So cool. So cool. So where, where, what are you doing now? You're not because you're focused on, well, this is this is the dad move, right? <laughs> so you have a franchise right. that you run right. with fewer HR challenges That's right. than your previous businesses. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you got into a franchise business after running things that you've started? Totally. Um, I love that you call it the dad move. And I'm going to actually go back to the franchisor and talk to the folks there and suggest that they start including that and then <laughs> the dad move. selling point <laughs> uh, and description for it. Um, but yes. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, a little, a little context around this. Um, uh, my business partners, Mark and Joe are the ones who, who run farmers union day to day. And um, when, uh, the barn night closed where I was managing day to day. Uh, there just was simply not enough work or revenue for all three of us to be working full time at Farmers Union. And uh, frankly, I was also interested in exploring something new at that point after doing food and beverage for, gosh, at that point, uh, you know, nearly 15 years. And so, uh, and so I had developed a, a great relationship and friendship with a customer from from the barn light who worked again in this building just two floors below uh and um he uh offered to hire me starting out to kind of be a project manager on some of his uh projects he he was a in the e-commerce world direct consumer uh, products and and so um he hired me to to um do all sorts of odd jobs. And so I ended up working for him full time uh, over the next couple of years, okay. doing all sorts of things. Um, and uh, it was great experience and uh, wore a lot of hats and managed customer service and started new brands and figured out how to make, you know, sports supplements and uh, all sorts of just wild random things. So it was great experience. Um, there were a few things I, I learned uh, in that process. One is, uh, gosh, I really want to work for myself again at some mm -hmm. point. Uh, and um, I would ideally not be in front of a computer screen as much as I was. Again, this is, and I didn't think about this before, but again, there was like a, an, an important moment um, that a revelation. Uh, my, my wife and I had our first kit while I had this job. I consider that pretty important. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Incredibly important. And it was awesome. And um, But I had this job where I could do so much work from my phone and I was constantly attached to my phone or my laptop and was working all the time. 
And I was neglecting my wife and our child. And I realized I needed to make a change. And that absolutely motivated me to do that. Um, and, uh, and so when, when I moved on from, from, from that uh, career path, um, I, I wanted to work for myself again, but I didn't want to start from scratch. I didn't want to have to come up with a whole new brand, a whole new business um, and, and care about every detail and what the color palette of the branding is like that stuff mattered less to me at this point. I cared about all of that so much before, but at this point I was mostly in, interested in, in um, profitability and, and that and, move. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it did not need to be sexy anymore. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, the person I worked with, one of his first questions is, was, um, so if I find you a business that uh, is in porta potties, uh, how would you feel about it? I said, ah, that's great. No problem. Yeah. I'm happy to sling porta potties around town if that's a good business yeah. and you can convince me it is. And so um, I think that's like a good question that he asked. And, uh, and just a, a point I make to stress, like the sexiness of the business no longer matters. Okay. to me. Um, and I'm mostly just interested in, in business more generally okay. um, and not and not specifically uh, it being a reflection of, of me. It's, um, it sounds like your work was very much um, a part of your identity oh, when um, you were oh, younger. Absolutely. Oh my heavens. Yeah. And, very good observation. And now your identity is based off of yeah, family and other friendships yeah. and and also being an entrepreneur. Totally. But not so much. Correct. Tied to absolutely being an entrepreneur. Absolutely. And so I, it makes sense. Right. And so you 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 make a very good point. And uh in addition to I think what my interests in businesses were evolving, my life had evolved and and so and looking for an opportunity that um was also I believed a, a good profitable business. It was also one that complemented sort of the work life uh, balance that I wanted yeah. at that point. So I, I wasn't pursuing something that was going to require me to work a hundred hours a week. Sure. After the gate. I wanted something that I could grow uh, at a pace that I felt comfortable with to be able to provide the attention to these other things that mattered a lot to me. So you talked to a franchise rep. Correct. New to me also, yeah. what is a franchise rep and what franchises did you consider? Just yes. briefly. Yes. Uh, and so unlike the, the business brokers out there, franchise reps, invaluable. I would absolutely not recommend signing up as a franchisee for a concept without working with a franchise rep. And so uh, it was a super fun experience. And you both could go through this experience and I have to sign a dotted line and learn a lot. Yeah. And I love the experience of it. And so, uh, yes, Jade, the, the franchise reps, they play matchmaker. They learn a lot about you, what your background is, your work experience, your business experience. A lot of uh, franchisees actually were never entrepreneurs or business owners before becoming franchisees. Huh. A lot of folks are uh, like uh, retirees or close to retiring and um, and then they decide they want to do something for themselves and, and they go into the franchise business. And so um, so the franchise rep plays matchmaker. They learn about your background, your interests, what you, what you like to do, what you'd like to absolutely steer clear from. They explore your market. They learn about it. They then uh, see what's out there that would be a good fit, you know, for your, your, your market demographic. And they present different options for you to consider. So what were those options? Because they're pretty fun and wild and right. interesting. And I also think it highlights the dad move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. totally, <laughs> totally. So so um, this gentleman I worked with was based out of Phoenix and he, um, it was quite the vetting process to get to this point, um, kind of learning a, a, about me and, and what I was looking for. And, and then he brought three different franchise concepts to the table. One was, and, and if none of those three hit the mark, then that's fine. He'll find find others. But um, uh, the three that he initially came to me with, one was called Blingle. And it was a lighting business, uh, kind of low voltage landscape lighting, but also holiday lighting, which <laughs> sounds wild, but is such 
a good and profitable business. Um, again, not super sexy. And you're working so hard, like, you know, November through January. During the holidays. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no one wants to work as much as they have to. But Maybe not uh, a great dad move. <laughs> no, no. But it's, <laughs> it is a great business. So this combined that great business with, with also a non-seasonal component of, of low voltage lighting for landscaping and patios and things like that. And it was called Wingle. And I said, wow, that's really intriguing. And this really does sound like the kind of thing I'm looking for. However, I love hanging Christmas lights in my home every year. Uh, and I've learned a couple of things in doing that. One is the quality of the Christmas lights that are made nowadays have rapidly deteriorated mm -hmm. uh, since I've been doing this uh, since I was a kid. Um, and, uh, and our environment where it rains a lot only makes that harder. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, if I do this, I am constantly going to be swapping out strands of lights with boom lifts and, you know, at, at the shopping centers and it's going to be miserable. Yeah. And I just, and then I wouldn't enjoy putting lights out of my house. Right. Anymore. right. So, right. so I, I regretfully uh, moved on from that option. Then the other one where I really felt like we dodged a bullet was a short term property rental management company, which I, you know, I think just depending on where you are, uh, Airbnbs and VRBOs have really taken a hit recently. And so that, that, that would have been, um, a tough one, but it was an interesting concept. Um, and then the one, uh, you're alluding to Jade was a fun one. This is what kind of initially got me interested in, in, in franchises. Um, uh, a friend of mine was pursuing this franchise in Phoenix and we considered just doing one together here in Eugene, uh, sort of a, a efficiency, a scale type of deal and uh, got far along in it, mm -hmm. uh, but realized the market wasn't quite white, uh, wasn't quite right. Um, and uh, this, this concept was called hammer nails. So it sounds like a business in the trades, like really tough, uh, but it was actually a, um, a manicure pedicure joint uh, targeted for, for men and like a barber shop and, you know, the shaves and things it. like that. But, you know, built out the interior is really sort of masculine and, you know, you got your, your, your beers and, 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 and cocktails and stuff that you're sitting down, getting a pedicure, watching sports on the big screen with your headphones on. And they've done really well, you know, at, uh, in different parts of the country. And so that was called Hammer Nails. It was a fun uh, concept to consider. Uh, but ultimately what we landed on uh, and, and what one of my... Uh, Mark, my existing business partner from the coffee shop, and I decided to pursue, uh, again, not sexy at all, uh, temporary wall systems. Is what a, what a I show. love this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You go hammer nails, yeah. like lingle, yeah. and then temporary walls. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely not sexy, but a really cool business. And so uh, it's an obvious problem with an obvious solution very simple to understand. Uh, and what that is, is uh, we provide containment for occupied renovation projects. And so the best example I give is hospitals. They're continually upgrading their facilities, but you can't shut down the whole hospital when you do construction. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still doctors and patients. And so you need to cordon off that construction zone from everyone else. And so we come in and we erect these walls uh, that are reusable uh, and uh, contain all of the dust and debris and noise uh, so that the other part of the facility can be used as it normally would. Uh, and so our employees, um, to uh, call back to what you were getting at, Jade, before, are, are uh, no longer individuals but walls. Yeah, we have. <laughs> so once they're up, they're earning us money. Uh, it's essentially like a fentanyl company. Um, but... Uh, Yes, we, Mark and I are the ones who install the walls and I, uh, my sort of day to day now is uh, finding jobs and doing sales work and connecting with uh, different builders and facilities folks to find those jobs. Because it, with the barn light, you what, hired about 10 people immediately, right? Correct. So yeah. I, I have a feeling that probably played a part in right. just like 
how hard that was and then the turnover and then yeah probably just wanted something like, yeah man yeah. managing people is hard yeah period yeah uh, no matter what business it is and like you know i'm i i one of my strengths and and at times it's burned me but uh i i care a lot about employees mm -hmm. uh i become friends with employees um like i mentioned i i'm still really great friends with with katie mm -hmm. and um and i love her and and so uh so i you know i i think that can just make it even harder when tough things happen um as we all are aware of and um and so uh we for a number of reasons we're just looking for something that didn't we already have a business where we we have to employ a large number of people and just hiring people in this day and age versus 10 years ago is a lot more challenging. Just mm -hmm. finding the people who want to work that job is like, it should be really cool to work at a bar and, and mm -hmm. a cafe. And, you know, I think some people still think it is, and we believe it is, uh, but um, it's, it's hard hiring mm -hmm. and, and finding people to work those jobs. And so to find an opportunity where we didn't have to hire out of the gate, just, you know, simply kind of explains itself why that was a, right. a desirable uh, opportunity and so were there any unexpected challenges with this new franchise business that yeah you, you didn't expect going in sure um yeah no doubt about it i mean for one i i never worked in the trades and construction with the exception of like working out the builders on our build outs for mm -hmm. cafes uh you know where i learned a lot but i was never a carpenter mm -hmm. uh and so um you know i think there's like a uh, a bit of a barrier there in, in terms of credibility and and working with builders who are like who are you like what are you right. trying to uh you know sell us and um once we got our first job that was a huge break could document it okay. um photograph it and then use that as evidence and and then essentially sell that job to other builders and folks out there and uh the the product and service is is great. I mean, this is uh, a product that, uh, unlike uh, traditional containment, where you're using, you know, plywood or, or drywall, super wasteful, super mm -hmm. messy. This is a reusable, sustainable product, zero waste essentially. Um, and uh, we just set these things up and take them down and use them for the next job. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I would say that was a big challenge: is just learning sales for an industry I was not. Uh, familiar with and, and appreciating sort of the long sales cycle. It seems like that first job really kind of launched. I mean, how did you get that first job without having a previous portfolio or anything? Great question. Uh, relationships, friendships. So uh, we were friends with, uh, we remained friends with the very first builder who did our build out of the barn light. Oh, and he, um, he gave us an opportunity uh, for an office remodel he had. And he said, you know, you've done a lot for us and I want to give you an opportunity to, to get your first job. And so I'm thankful for that. He, uh, he allowed us to put our walls up for an office remodel he did. And, um, wow. so yeah, that, huge. That, that's how that's it so happened. Cool. That's another yeah. theme I'm, I'm, I'm hearing just the, you know, community, the community and relationships like it, right. it, you know, might not pay off what next week, next month, yeah. next year. I mean, how many years did, you know, since he worked, you, you work with them at the barn life, uh, 2012. Uh, 12 years. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's amazing. That's, that's, a, that's a payoff. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. I'd like to say, oh man, it was, you know, cause I, yeah, I, I was so persuasive in one of my 150 <laughs> cold calls to builders and facilities folks that they were so convinced that, uh, and I did a, such a good job selling it, uh, that they got us in there, but no, it wasn't that it was a friend who threw us a bone. But it was simpler, right? It was simpler than that. It wasn't yeah. you having to do it the hard way. Right. It was through relationship. Right. It's a testament to your ability to, yeah, well, you know, form yeah. And, and maintain these awesome 100%. yeah partnerships. Yeah. And all right, so we're getting close to time. Okay. So there's a couple things I would like to talk about before we wrap today. Um, what's next is the first one, and then we're going to go into a lightning round, and I'm just going to throw a couple. Super random questions at you. Sounds great. So what's next? My heavens. Well, really, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing a lot on this new uh, franchise uh, concept. Um, 
PWS and growing that. And eventually we really do want to hire our first employee and, and grow that. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's what's next immediately. Uh, I think I shared with you though, what is very cool about um, the franchise business is um, this concept is, is owned by a company called Homefront Brands, which has other franchise concepts. And ours is a little bit of an outlier, but there are other franchise concept or businesses like home inspection and, uh, you know, fence building and pest control and pressure washing. And so uh, super smart. All of those have the same customer at the mm-hmm. end of the day. And so uh, eventually one could um, could start sort of adding on those different concepts because they're marketing to the same person. Uh, Temp Walls is more B2B, uh, so it's a little bit of an outlier there. But I just mentioned that because it kind of demonstrates the opportunity out there in terms of franchises. And so uh, definitely intrigued in that uh, world, and we'll continue to explore that. Uh, but beyond um, growing the business, you know, we just, my wife uh, had our second uh child uh, okay. who's three months old you thank you oh how are you sleeping jeez yes how are you awake right. <laughs> yeah. well uh, my wife does uh, most of the work to be honest in terms of uh the breastfeeding in the middle of the night which yeah. i can't help but with but um that the f- focusing on the family right now a three-year-old and a three-month-old is is really what's next in all ways and so yeah. um so i'm i'm really thrilled and excited to it's awesome that. yeah, that's great it's awesome that you've got it dialed in so your work is working for you and you're not working for it quite as much as you were back in the barn light well, days. Thanks. Yes, yeah. that's true. That's true. It's amazing. All right. Lightning round. Lightning round. All right. Are we, and this is our first time doing the lightning round. So Shopping. let's just, me, let's see support. how it goes. Okay. Um, okay. Should I time this? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is a daily habit that helps you stay grounded and connected to what's most important? Uh, a couple of things. Um, I uh, love reading. And so finding time to read every day uh, is very important. Um, if one hasn't uh, already looked at this, one of my favorite things to just read every morning or in the evening before I go to bed is a book called The Daily Stoic, um, which is incredible. It uh, has a new page for each day, the top of which has a passage from um, uh, a work by a Stoic, um, like Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, uh, and then just sort of like a, a little summary uh, or uh, uh, sort of a, a, a motivation for thinking about what that passage uh, is saying. And so uh, that's like just a quick, easy read mm-hmm. to do every day that I feel like helps me become a better person. Uh, and then something you know, I think my wife and I both saw on our shared Instagram algorithm is to um, kiss my wife for at least six seconds before I leave uh, for work in the morning, um, because there's a whole lot of reasons I won't get into, but at least six seconds okay. to kiss. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Yeah. Um, key lesson you've learned from your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, stay positive and stay kind uh, and don't take yourself too seriously are the main lessons. Okay. Well, and my next one is going to be a piece of advice for someone starting a business. Sounds like staying kind and positive would be oh. one part of that advice. Do you, is there something else that comes to mind though? Uh, ask questions. So absolutely chat with as many people as you can um, and ask questions uh, about whatever you're interested in in terms of uh, your your own pursuits to learn from others' experience. Okay. What about a misconception about running a small business? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, what do people think it's yeah, like and it's it. just not? Well. Or not quite that. You know, it looks a lot sexier than it actually is. Um, it's a lot harder than it looks. Uh, and so I think those are simply the biggest misconceptions. Okay. It's interesting because it seems like it looks hard and you're saying it's harder than that. Oh, always. <laughs> okay. Always. <laughs> so last question, then how do you balance it? Sounds like in the first six months, it's hard to do it. Right. But down the road, like, how do you balance it? Um, again, I think 
prioritizing taking care of yourself needs to be front of mind uh, in terms of exercise and nutrition um, and uh, building and maintaining friendships, you know, having that outlet. I'm very fortunate to be able to work with business partners who uh, are more my friends than my business partners at mm. this point. Uh, I frankly wouldn't want to run a business by myself. I, I really love the opportunity mm. to do it with somebody else that I care about and respect. And, um, and so I think um, it's important to not feel like you have to do everything on your own. Mm. And that's not a sign of weakness whatsoever. Mm. Uh, it's, there's so much value in learning from others and working with others. That's great. Well, with that, that's a good conclusion right there. Jeez. Thank you so much. Heck yeah. Thank you all. This was a blast. For joining yeah. us today. Yep, yep. It's been amazing. Oh, it's a blast. Thank you all yeah. very much for inviting me to join. Yeah. And thanks for listening. And um, we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time.